Hi, I'm Brendan Radabaugh, and welcome back to the Orlando Regional Workshop Series sponsored by the Orange County Government. I'm here with Ryan Remmers and Jordan Kilman from the Flu Power Society. Jordan, can you tell me more about your first background? Sure. I'm a first alumni from Team 204 in, <laughs> in uh, Voorhees, New Jersey. Um, I moved down to Florida to become a mechanical ride and show engineer at Disney. And Ryan, what is your background in first? My background started in 2007 with the uh, interview of several teams, Bacon being one of those, and my son Andrew being very interested. We uh, immediately joined a team after our interview uh, with some of the teams. And what are we going to be talking about today? Today we're going to be talking about fluid power. Um, we're going to give you some helpful hints. We're going to work through a circuit, um, show you some components, um, how to adjust some things, put some Teflon tape, cut some tubing, etc. Okay, Ryan Jordan, if you want to get started, you can. Excellent. Thank you, Brendan. Thanks. Yeah, so Ryan and I are both with the IFPS, the International Fluid Power Society. And in relation with the NFPA, the National Fluid Power Association, we wanted to come here and just show you some uh, of the basics of the uh, pneumatic systems that you all are going to be working with. Um, before I get started, there are a couple scholarships that I wanted to make you aware of. The NFPA has a Fluid Power Challenge scholarship. And it's for any student who has done FIRST Robotics. And then there's the NFA, NFPA Association Scholarship. And that's if you plan on pursuing a technical career. So please check those out. Um, and then we'll just get into it. But before we get too far, safety first, please. Anytime you're using pneumatics, wear your glasses. And these have compressed air. And they are potential energy that even if the power is off, the, that energy is still there. So please always respect the systems that you're working with. Cylinders are innately pinch points. And never connect or disconnect anything under pressure. You be sure that there's no pressure in the system before you're taking off any hoses, OK? Um, so like I said, three major goals today. We want to show you some practical applications of fluid power in industry, uh, then help you understand those basics of a first pneumatic circuit then share some helpful hints Ryan and I have come across in our time working with fluid power. So for my work, I wanted to show you this picture from Mission Space. Uh, I, wanted to, I know everyone thinks about animatronics, perhaps, when they think about hydraulics and pneumatics. But it's everywhere in the parks and in industry. And right in this picture, there are several actuators that are all pneumatically actuated. Um, the door locks here when the door swings close. And even the door swing closes done pneumatically. So at the top there, are those, those are some rotary actuators. And on the sides there are uh, linear ones that control the lock. Now in industry, same thing everywhere. A lot of food processing plants use pneumatics to grip a uh, product and move it around. Pneumatics is great because you can control the gripping strength just by the pressure. And it's not uh, subject to any uh, electrical mishaps. Um, so now we're going to get into a part where we're going to step through the manual which brings me to please read the manual. We did our best to get the best ofs, but things change year to year. So please read the manual and be sure you know what you need to do for that year. Thanks, Jordan. I can only stress enough, read your manual because it's going to give you all the details from year to year. All right, there's a couple reasons that you want to use pneumatics. Typically, it's readily available. Uh, most of your uh, kits come with compressors. Uh, so it's readily available. It's easy to store. You have nice storage tanks that you can easily mount on your uh, robot. Um, it's simple design. You have a couple of control valves, some, some other miscellaneous parts, and you can control cylinders moving up and down. Um, it's, it's powerful. It can be quick. Um, and it's versatile as far as the movements that you can mo make you know, from a linear type motion to a rotary type motion to a slide type motion. So there's lots of different uh, uh, options for mechanical movements. Um, plus, air is relatively free. We have a lot of it around other than the power to compress it. So we're going to step into a few of the components. Um, most of the components you have are laid out here, but you got your, your compressor to compress the air. You got your regulator to regulate it. You got your fittings to control the direction or as far as uh, supply. You got your control valves for actuation. And then you got your cylinders for movement. 
So we're going to start off with a pretty simple system. We have an older compressor here. Um, you guys might have seen some of these back in the uh, 2007 time when I started. This is probably one from that era. Um, the compressors are going to take the air in through the inlet. It's going to have a reciprocating piston and it's going to uh, compress the air and push it out into the system. You always want to make sure you have a check valve on the outlet of the compressor. Because if you don't have a check valve on the outlet of the compressor, any stored air is going to want to move back through the compressor. Um, if you look at the PowerPoint, we actually have a demonstration of a piston type compressor. Um, the IE motor in the back compressing a piston. You have the lower check valve on the inlet pulling in the air. And then you have the outlet check valve um, as the air is compressed, pushed into the system. Yeah, I mean, one of the major advantages of uh, compressed air and fluid power on your robot is going to be the, the weight savings. Once you've made that investment into a single compressor, now you can have all these actuators that are all just aluminum that are much lighter than a series of 10 different motors may have been. So for the weight investment of just one heavy compressor, you can uh, do a lot of different actions without tacking on more and more weight with extra extra motors. So one of the first or second components we're talking about is the, the check valve. Very important that this check valve is on the outlet of the compressor because it keeps the stored or the compressed air from going backwards through the, the, the compressor. It'll help you keep your system up to pressure. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is the main relief valve. Um, these guys don't always come preset. They should be set close to 125 PSI. Um, one of the ways that you can actually adjust these, which um, you can loosen up this set nut, and then by turning this end nut counterclockwise or clockwise, you can increase or decrease the pressure. The system pressure we want set at 125 PSI. So once you set that pressure at 125 PSI, you set your lock nut back down so it maintains. And that's your overall safety. If the pressure switch goes bad, the pump goes rogue, um, this here will help save your system from potentially an explosion of air uh, from, from uh, overpressurization. Um, the next thing in line is a pressure switch. I sort of have this on this configuration here. Um, this is one of our older school pressure switch switches. These guys are set preset at 125 PSI. So what you're going to do is you're going to um, electrically connect these two contacts into the connection of the compressor. Not quite as simple as this, but essentially you're going to be feeding through here. So as long as this is below 125 PSI, you're going to be feeding electrical connection to your compressor and your compressor will operate. When the pressure switch meets, reaches its 125 PSI, it disconnects, turns off the compressor. It's important that way as you use the air in your system, the compressor can come on and off as needed uh, based on your air usage. Yeah, and if you think about it, uh, luckily the first manual has a lot of information on how to wire it correctly for each control system and everything like that. And if it's misset, you risk not having all the available air that you want during that match. So it's super important to make sure these things are set right and set up correctly, or else you're really putting yourself to a disadvantage. All right, uh, storage tanks. Um, I have an older school aluminum style storage tank. Uh, essentially, you can, uh, I believe the rules say you can put as many as these on your um, robot as required for your storage. Yeah, needed. back in my day, they only let us have like three, I think. Uh, now it's unlimited, I believe. It's unlimited. Yeah. Yeah, this happens to be aluminum one. I think they have some uh, polymer versions these days, a little bit lighter, um, but still serve the same serve the same purpose. They're a storage unit. Once the compressor compresses the air, the air receiver stores the air, and then when you actuate it, it takes the air from the storage tank out to your cylinders. Um, the, the dump valve, very, very important. After you get all of this built up, you have your compressor, you have your storage tank, you have your pressure switch. Once you have all of this in line, how do you take and make your system safe at the end of the, at the, end of the match? You always want to have a ball valve or an uh, on-off valve that you can dump the air 
drain the system so you can make it safe to operate. Because remember, air is compressible, and if you go to unlock a tube, it could actually whip you and create damage. Yeah, and it gets, and luckily first keeps our pressures relatively low, but when you get out into industry, there's a lot more pressure in hydraulics and a lot more danger. So it's just good to always have those respect for the compressed fluids, because it can really surprise you, and you can't see it uh, other than on a gauge. Speaking of gauges, this is where things get a little bit more complicated, but this is where one of the, the strengths of a pneumatic system. So in every pneumatic system, you're gonna have two sides. There's a working pressure and a stored pressure. The working pressure is gonna control how much force your actuators can operate with. And the stored is how much you can hold back to stay at a constant working pressure. So Why if, do you wanna have the high pressure? So a, a high stored pressure lets you replenish that working pressure side very quickly so that you have a constant force profile across your actuator. So say, for instance, uh, like that mission space op uh, uh, example I showed earlier, when that door's closing, you don't want the door to start fast and then slow down. You want it to have one smooth cycle. So, because you want that to be moving at the same speed and force along the entire length. If you only had one pressure, as soon as it starts moving, that pressure is going to drop. So, you have that working pressure, that stored pressure behind the working to replenish. That way, your working always stays at a steady 60 while your stored pressure dips and is then replenished by the compressor. Also, maybe your storage tanks aren't adequate for the system and you start operating several cylinders, the pressure is gonna go down. So it's important to have that higher stored pressure at 125 PSI and your minimal working pressure is at 60 PSI. Yeah. So the 60 PSI is a lower pressure so that physical damage can't, you know, you can't be hurt as bad, even though it's very, I'll we'll be very careful about that. 60 pounds on a one inch cylinders, uh, 60, 60 pounds of force. But if you had 125 PSI on that one inch cylinder, that's 125 pounds of force. So it's a lot of, a lot of extra force if you're running a high pressure. Now, while we're speaking about regulators, setting them is also equally important. When you set them, you'll notice that there's a cap that gets pulled out or pushed back in to lock. When you do that, you want to push it out and back it all the way down. You're going to see this pressure go all the way down. Even though you know that you've got 120 PSI in your system, you're going to, this gauge is going to be showing you what's going on on that working side, right? And follow the arrows, okay? You have the arrows going to show you this your 120 goes in here, and then you, you theoretically have your regulated. Your, yeah, your regulated pressure going to all these spots. So that's why you have the gauge attached it, not the arrow. Gauge attached it, not the arrow. Right, so as I was saying, you wanna go counterclockwise to loosen up, you're gonna see that pressure drop. You're gonna have a ton of stored pressure, but not a lot of working pressure. And you're gonna gradually work your way up. And that gauge is gonna climb and climb, and you wanna slowly reach your 60 PSI desire limit, then squeeze it and lock it off, okay? It's important that you follow the arrows of the, of the, uh, the flow, because if the regulator's installed backwards, you can actually see a higher pressure than what you anticipate. Yeah. Awesome. So yeah, and then uh, that goes out to your working components. That's all the other things in your system that we haven't talked about so far. All your fittings, your T's, your valves, everything like that are considered working components. You have tons of different accessories. Uh, we've got a bunch here. I know uh, there are providers online. Andy Mark has boxes and boxes of different kinds of T's and, uh, and fittings that can make your system neat and tidy on that robot. Uh, we do want to take a second about Teflon tape. Teflon tape. Teflon tape, it's a, it, it helps lubricate. It's really not a sealant. And uh, in the past, when I was walking through some of the, um, the pits. Pit, pit areas, you could see people putting on Teflon tape. There's a right way of doing it. Um, and I'm going to show you how to do it, but uh, I want to sort of go over it. You see how I missed the first thread of the fitting? The reason I did that is because Teflon tape, it acts as a lubricant, but if you get it into the system, it can actually malfunction a control valve. So when you put this on, you want to make sure you're at least one thread back and only do about two wraps. 
You don't need to do two or th you don't need to do five or six. You don't need to wrap it up. So it, once you wrap it, that's a good wrap. And you always want to go the direction of the threads. So when you screw that fitting into a component, which I don't have one that size. Um, yeah, there we go. When you screw that in, the Teflon tape doesn't back itself out. So by screwing it back in, or doing it the clockwise direction of the threads, it follows the tape in. And then there you have a, a really good um, Teflon covered fitting. You want to go roughly finger tight plus a quarter turn. You do not need to tighten these guys all the way down. Finger tight plus quarter. Yeah, you don't need a big gob of Teflon tape at the end of it. The Teflon tape is not what's creating your seal. It's that snug, lubricated fit, and that's what the Teflon's helping you do. I'm going to take just a moment to talk about off-board compressors because I don't see it very often, but it is something that's allowed in your rule book. In theory, you're allowed to have an off-board compressor, which means prior to that match, you're going to pressurize your system, put your 120 into your stored pressure side, but then you're going to walk away from your compressor and put your robot out on the field. If you are super confident that you can have no leaks and that you only need to actuate a couple times, this can be a great weight savings. But if uh, you have some leaks or if you know you have a gripper that's gonna be opening and closing throughout a match, you're gonna very quickly run out of air if you don't have the compressor. So that's all I'll say about that. Next we're gonna get into some control valves. Um, there's typically two types of a control valves. Um, you want to get into your manual because the manual specifically tells you what size uh, as far as the size or flow rate of the actual valve. I got a couple different older versions of some valves here. Um, in, in here is a, another type of a valve, um, single solenoid, single solenoid. This guy here has got a double solenoid. So um, typically you're going to have a two position five way. The solenoid, when it's energized, shifts the valve from port B to port A. And then when it de-energizes, it goes back the other way. On a double solenoid valve, this coil controls the flow through one of the ports. And you have to maintain it, keep the power on, in order to keep the air going to that particular port. But when you go to shift the valve, you need to de-energize that one and energize this one. And when you energize that, it re reverses the function of the valve and lets the cylinder come back. Um, lots of different options on control valves. Uh, yeah, definitely read the manual of the valve that you have. It's going to tell you how to operate it the right way, when to turn on and off the uh, power. If it just needs a pulse or if it needs constant, like Ryan was saying, it's going to be completely con uh, dependent on your specific valve. You also want to check your voltages. Yeah. Um, you guys should be all 12 volt VDC. They make these valves in 110, 24, 220. Just make sure the voltage is correct on your, on your valve with your system. That's a great point. Just like there's single and double acting valves, there are also single and double acting actuators. So this is a symbol on the screen of a double acting cylinder. And it's probably the most common that I see out in the first teams. You have a port on both sides of the, uh, uh, the, the body, so you can force air onto either side. Um, it takes air to put air in the base, the cylinder extends. You put air in the rod end, the cylinder retracts. Yep, and I've got a, a really detailed cutaway in the PowerPoint slides. If you're really interested in what's going on in there, it saves you a, a, the... <laughs> The, the urge to try and cut one open. <laughs> <laughs> so that's your double acting. There's also spring actuated uh, single acting cylinders, which are very similar, but they're only gonna have one hole on either the, the rod side or the cap side, and they'll be returned to the opposite with a spring. Uh, lots of different uh, reasons why you might do that. You're gonna use less air that way, but you're gonna have less control and perhaps less uh, force if you're relying on that spring to return. All right, so uh, what we have up on the screen and what we have here on the table is sort of a basic pneumatic circuit. Um, we're using the ANSI symbols of control valves, flow control cylinders, regulators, storage tanks. Um, I think your manual only has pictorials of these components, but this is actually the way they're, they're drawn out. And 
I've been doing this for quite a number of years. I can read this like a roadmap. It tells me what I need to know about this particular circuit. Yeah, it's great for when I'm in the field and uh, say I'm having some sort of problem and I need to call Ryan. Hey, I don't know why this isn't working. He goes, well, send me the schematic because I don't know what gibberish you're talking. So we're going to go. I don't know if you guys can see this very well, but here's our typical compressor. Here's what they can see. Right? Here's our, our pop-off valve or main regulator. This guy right here is our storage tank. Um, over here, we have our pressure switch. And then we go into our regulator with gauge. And then we go into our control valves. And we go into our flow controls, which are flow controls. I have one example here. I have some on our cylinders here. I'll show you how those go. And then we go into our cylinder out on the end. So that's basically the componentry that you would have. Obviously, you can pick different sizes based on your loads, based on your speeds, um, and your application. And in the industry, these cylinders go from roughly four millimeter in bore size to almost 15 to 20 inches, just depending upon what the application is. So speaking of flow controls. Flow controls. <laughs> if there's one thing in the pits that I see is people adjusting flow controls incorrectly. Um, there's two types. There's a meter in and a meter out. Almost all pneumatic applications use a meter out application. The reason you do that is you want to control the speed of the cylinder. Oh, I have this air on. You want to control the speed of the cylinder. So how do you control the speed of a cylinder when the air is compressible? If I put air in here, this actually, I compress the air so I'm in a meter out condition. So in order to change the speed of this cylinder as it extends, I need to adjust the rod and flow control. As you can see, it goes back normal, but now that I've loosened up the flow control, I have a, a faster extend time. Again, it goes back normal. Now, if I tighten this back down, you'll see that it slows it much down. Matter of fact, you can stop it if you turn it in too far, but you can control the speed as it goes out. It's gonna be the same condition if you have one on your blind side, it's gonna control the speed in which it retracts. And I'll show you that here um, in these two applications that we have set up. This is actually a game we played in Orlando um, when we did our class there. After we got done doing our class, we had the 10, 15 students assemble a typical circuit. So they took this circuit that we have in front of us and they assembled it. So we have our compressor down underneath here. We have our regulator. We have some control valves. We have our cylinder, which is going to act as a throw-in device, and we have some flow controls. Um, these two are set up completely different. One is going to go very quickly, and one is going to go very slowly as they extend. The other part about it is because I have the flow control set tighter on the retract side, they're both going to come back slowly. And I can actually show you this a couple of times. We don't have to have the balls in here, but uh, for example, here goes uh, this guy over here. You see how the flow control controlled how fast that cylinder actually extended. Now when we go to this guy over here, I get a much quicker, however more violent actuation. And then when I bring it back, very controlled. And on this one here, I bring it back, also very controlled. But you see how quickly this one extended, and that's because the flow control is near wide open, where the flow control on this one is much further closed. Again, yeah, when you when you have a <laughs> yeah, when you have an ill setup system, you're going to see chattering and performance that you're just not desired. And as you get into industry, right, more bang is more wear, and it's going to really decrease the life of your components. Let me, let me, I guess let me go back a little bit on the flow control a little bit. The flow control is a device that controls speed or flow in one direction. Um, like the symbol has, it has a check valve in it. So the check valve allows free reverse flow. So the cylinder, so when the air comes in, it's free to pass right by the flow control and then controlled on the outlet side. When it's reversed, when the air comes back out the other way, the air is controlled via a needle valve 
that's adjustable. So this here controls a needle valve that is internal here. But there's a check valve that allows the air to go into the system, but when it comes out, it goes over a orifice. This is a flow control. You can think about like the hose uh, in your backyard when you put your thumb over it, right? And when you decrease the size of the opening, you're gonna have a lot faster, but a lot less flow through. Same principle here. You're, you're controlling how much fluid, air or water or hydraulic fluid, that makes it through that orifice. And you can see how I adjusted by turning this out, how much it actually changes. So by bringing it back in, restricting the flow. So if you're wanting to move something slowly, more precisely, a flow control adjusted or tuned in would be a much better option than having it wide open, banging and potentially causing damage to your machine. Yeah, I guess the last final thing to talk about flow controls, you'll notice if we can get in a shot here, there's a little nut that's gonna control when you get that perfect setting just the way you want it, make sure you tighten down that set nut because that's what's gonna prevent it from screwing up uh, later as you, your machine vibrates and uh, goes through the competition. That's, that way you don't lose your setting through match to match. Yeah, so there's different types. This one's got a neural knob, so by it, as Jordan said, by turning that neural knob down tight, it keeps the ability from adjusting the actual flow control. So once you get it tuned in, lock the flow controls in. Yeah. So a couple more top tips, uh, leak prevention. Yeah, so the biggest thing that uh, decreases the efficiency of a pneumatic or hydraulic system, leaks. I see people do this all the time. What happens when you cut it like this? It means a very distorted end. Um, every one of these fittings has got a O-ring on the inside of it. So when you take and push something like this into that there, it cuts the O-ring. The other part about it is the O-ring has to seal on the outside of the tubing. If you have this so poorly cut tubing going into here, you're gonna have leaks. So again, your compressor is gonna be operating, it's gonna be wearing your battery down, you won't have the air that you need to operate your functions. Get a proper tube cutter, which just has a little V-groove, puts the tubing right in the middle, cuts the fitting off straight, and allows you to take and put it in very nicely into the fitting. Yeah, well-cut tube uh, really saves a lot of your system. Uh, yeah, and detection, use your ears and eyes. Luckily with Pneumatics, when you have a leak, it doesn't also get messy. That's not necessarily the case with hydraulics, uh, trust me. But use your ears, use your eyes, and a little soapy water sprayed on the fittings, away from your electronics, can help you find uh, the smallest leaks around your fittings too. Um, design, side loading. This is actually an application. One of the students put this on a, a extending cylinder, or extending uh, arm, and it was too much force for the cylinder. Actually, there was some side load. So now what happened is I, I spent the money for the cylinder because I didn't properly engineer the application, I've damaged the cylinder. So now the cylinder is basically scrap. You can't, rep you can't repair something like that. So um, by- a good demo. It was a good demo. It becomes a good demo. <laughs> All right, so the last thing we'll talk about is actuator force, because everyone always asks, well, how do I know how large an actuator do I need to lift the game piece this year? And it's a very simple formula. Force equals the pressure times the area. And when it says the area, they're talking about the area of the cylinder, the bore, the diameter, right? The, the, the area that comes from that diameter. So I'll keep the numbers uh, vague, but if I pick a, a, a if I have a 50 pound crate and I need to lift a, uh, that crate up straight in the air with an actuator and I have 60 pounds of working, I should be just fine letting it lift with, the, uh, with that 60 pounds. But I might find it's a little different in, in a different scenario. Someone says, hey Jordan, why I, I, I'm using a 60 pound cylinder, one inch bore, just like it was before, but now it's not working. So this system's not working because Actuators are unbalanced. 
You have that rod there. So when you say, what is that area? Think about that formula, right? Force equals pressure times area. The pressure stays the same, but what does the area do? The best way you can picture it is think of it like the area of a donut. On that cap side is going to be the picture on your left in the PowerPoint. You have the whole bore of the, the cap side. That's this side here. That's going to be what you get also to extend points. with, right? But once you retract, like the, the seesaw setup, you see, you, you have to uh, account for the size of the rod. That's taking away some of your acting area, right? So when you're retracting and you need to know what the force it can pull with, use the area of the donut. And uh, that's what we've got for you today. I hope we hit some important information. Uh, Ryan and I are available. Uh, glad to answer your questions. Um, mostly, do the student's robot have to have pneumatics on the robot to get a scholarship? For the NFPA scholarships, uh, as long as you have a, a robot that has in the past used it and you can talk about it intelligently, I'm I sure. I think there's an fine. essay, like a 500-word yeah. essay that they have yeah. to do this. So they can talk about the pneumatics and the function of the pneumatics okay. in their essay. Um, and then with all your different actuators and the different types of actuators, which ones on the table would be your favorite? Mm. Mm. You know, there's always the best uh, actuator for the job. It, it has to do with the application. Um, every application is going to call out its parameters. Um, and I've used, if, if it's a space restraint and I can't afford to have a rod going out either way, a rodless type cylinder where it moves within its own body um, is a really nice option. Um, they're a little more expensive when you consider something like a traditional cylinder like this. If you have the additional space to work with, um, you can do that. But they make these cylinders in all types of different kinds. Like here's a compact version of a cylinder. It still has this one clevis on the back. It still has a piston and a rod, extended retract, but it's more of a compact. So there's almost every type of cylinder for every type of function. A guided version. So we were talking about you know, side-loading actuators. If you're in a situation where you can't get away from some side-loading, guided actuators can be a really great solution. <laughs> yeah, guided actuators can be a great solution because then you get to use uh, these side pieces that are guiding that out and it's supporting your, your actuating rod that's actually coming in and out of the middle. Yeah, the side, it actually has bearings on each side and then it has an air cylinder down the center. So these guide bearings help hold the, the side load of the rod as it extends in and out. Yeah. So you're less likely to get a little bit of a... You would be a lot less likely to get that. You have proper bearings rather than the seals, because if, if you're side loading one of these things, you're, you're basically putting all that load on the seals, and you're going to get leaks and yep. chattering and all sorts of problems that way. As, as Jordan said, at the side load, because this piston is so short, when the cylinder gets all the way extended, this bearing is minimal. So what happens is the rod can move up and down. In, in an application, if you're doing this a lot, say you play the game, you're practicing, you've got hours practicing, and now you're in the middle of a match, and suddenly your air cylinder starts to leak. And because of the side load, if the side load pulls down on the rod, the bearing here causes a tip, this seal wears out, and then you have a leaker. Yep. And then it may not extend or retract like you need it to. It's gonna chatter, it's gonna bind. So that's the other thing that the guided ones help with is binding. And does the Fluid Power Society have resources available that we can find, and where can we find them? There are a ton of uh, resources online. On the IFPS website, there's student resources and student memberships you can even have, and that's really what the organization is about, is about, uh, about education and resources like that. And would, would students be able to email and talk to you all? Absolutely. Uh, our information, I'm sure, will be attached to uh, these videos, yes? I'm getting a yes. <laughs> They will hunt us down from everywhere. Oh, that to help. <laughs> well, Ryan, Jordan, thank you very much for joining us for this web workshop series. Thank you again to the Orange County government for sponsoring this series. And again, thank you for coming. Thank you, Brandon. Thanks for having us. Excellent. FIRST Robotics Competition is the world's landmark robotics competition for students. In school you read about stuff, but in FIRST as a whole, you actually go and do it. 
In the beginning of January, the challenge comes out every year. Under strict rules and limited time and resources, you have to design, build, program, and test a robot. There's no blueprint. We get a few rules and guidelines to follow, and then it's up to those students to find something that works. There's nothing better than just seeing your robot on the field playing for the first time. They're all there like, is it gonna work? Is it gonna work? And then it works, it's the best feeling ever. You have mentors that are actually in the field that can tell you, oh, this is why this works, and this is the science behind it. And you're like, oh wow, that makes so much sense. They do a great job, not just about STEM, but about life. You know, how to go through college, how to go through, you know, a tough, you know, physics class. At face value, first robotics competition is a robot competition, but at the end of the day, it's so much more than that. People ask me, like, oh, you build robots? I said, no, it's, we're really running a business and all the things that go along with that. We deal with a lot of marketing, social media. I've learned business side of things, problem solving, working in groups. I'm learning how to communicate with people, how to reach out to local businesses. So we kind of have robotics as the starting point, but we branch out to different areas and expand. So the, the ultimate goal every year is always to get to the first championship. The first championship is basically like the Olympic for robots. There's hundreds of teams from all over the world there, and you get to see some of the best teams that exist. It's very competitive, but you're friends with the people that you're going against. It's like a sport, but in its own way, it's better than a sport. Being part of FIRST has really changed my life and you know how I think about myself, how I think about others. Participating in FIRST actually taught me that I'm capable of doing anything that I set my mind to. FIRST has really inspired me to give back in my old elementary school. I'm trying to help their robotics program that just started this year. I want those kids to have the opportunity to learn about STEM. As a participant in the FIRST program in high school, you get access to $80 million worth of scholarships. There are scholarships for colleges, universities, as well as technical programs. It also looks really good on the actual application to be on FIRST. FIRST does a really great job trying to open programs to make sure that you could actually accomplish anything in STEM, no matter where you're from, your background, your language, or anything like that. I really do consider myself part of the STEM community, and I couldn't be more prouder to say that. FIRST Robotics Competition is one of four engaging FIRST programs that shows students unique challenges and helps them learn new engineering skills and real world skills that'll help them in the future. First is the future. First is accomplishment. First is passion. First is inspiring. First is changing my story.